It's not just Wall Street that needs occupying. We need to occupy all streets, or really reoccupy them. About a century ago, city streets were taken over by cars and trucks without real consideration of the long-term effects. At first, the automobile must have seemed an innocuous replacement for the horse and carriage. It occupied less space, its emissions were mostly invisible, and you couldn't step in them. Of course, early cars were for the 1%, just as the horse and carriage had always been. Then, Henry Ford started making cheap cars, and before long, many families could afford one. Car traffic soon began to choke city streets. The traffic problems were all too obvious, but it was years before we realized just how toxic the exhaust fumes were. Today, the automobile rules nearly every American city street. Woe to the pedestrian or cyclist who attempts to occupy the street. In Europe, however, many city streets have been reoccupied in the past 30 years. Now that the cars are gone, these are the most popular streets in the city. The problems with cars are so familiar that we rarely think about them. But in the spirit of the Occupy movement, it's time to reconsider the costs of cars. Let's run through the list. Cars kill street life. Simply put, on streets with heavy traffic, people don't know their neighbors and rarely have anything to do with them. When people don't even know their neighbors, it's difficult to care very much about them. Democracy depends on strong community and basic shared values. Good public spaces nurture community. Cars occupy too much land. Car infrastructure often claims more than half a city's land. Cars foster suburban sprawl. The huge amount of space required by cars pushes destinations farther apart, working against the very purpose of the car. Cars are such bad neighbors that people seek refuge in low-density suburbs. Cars cause air pollution. Even though modern cars pollute less per mile traveled, there are so many of them traveling so far that many urban areas suffer from bad air. It's not just the stink, air pollution kills. Cars blot a city's beauty. It may be argued that individual cars are beautiful, even sculptural, However, streets clogged with cars are always uglier than when empty. Cars disturb people with their noise. Noise has been shown to contribute to stress and heart attacks. Cars kill and maim huge numbers of people every year. Cars harm public health by discouraging people from walking and cycling, which are healthy and pleasant once cars are gone. Cars are one of the largest sources of carbon dioxide emissions and a huge contributor to climate change. Cars waste energy and are the most energy intensive mode of transport. Fossil fuels are in short supply and it is foolish to waste them on driving. We need oil to grow food at least until we can restore sustainable agriculture. Recent efforts to promote continuing automobile dependence have turned to biofuels and hydrogen. Both technologies are essentially mythical. Cars consume natural resources, the extraction of which devastates the environment. These resources might better be left in the ground or applied to more urgent needs. Cars are driving us poor. No means of moving people around our cities costs so much. Most of the costs are not even borne by drivers. This gigantic subsidy drains the public treasury. Many costs of driving can't even be expressed in money, such as school children distracted by noise, the ugliness of auto-centric streets, and death. Cars destroyed mixed-use neighborhoods. It's no longer possible to walk to school, work, shopping, and recreation, so people drive to almost everything. These costs are hidden subsidies paid by society as a whole. Just as with the banks, nobody ever asked if we were willing to pay them. The 1% argues that there is no alternative to our current system and that people love to drive. In reality, most people no longer enjoy driving. Other modes are so unpleasant that people can scarcely imagine using them. However, in most European cities, driving is expensive and inconvenient people tend to avoid it. In Amsterdam, cycling accounts for half of all trips. 
In Venice, nearly all trips are on foot. In New York and Tokyo, people rely on excellent rail systems to get around. In large cities, only rail systems can provide adequate transport capacity. So, let us consider the optimum number of cars in cities. In Manhattan, relatively few people drive, but the city seems crammed with cars. The few people in cars are taking up far more than their fair share of scarce street space. At the same time, they fill the city with chaos, noise, pollution, and danger. Consider the recently reoccupied Times Square in the heart of the city. Pedestrians were crammed onto narrow sidewalks and the roar and congestion of traffic overwhelmed the space. Since traffic was removed from Broadway, Times Square has been transformed. It's far more pleasant and people linger to enjoy the city's magic. So, if fewer cars are almost always better, wouldn't no cars be best? Consider Venice almost entirely car free. The city is calm but vibrant. You can hear yourself think. The Italians call it the most serene place. So you may ask, what's it like to live in a car-free city? Let's take a quick tour of car-free city centers in Spain. The current economic crisis was caused in large part by banks making crazy loans in far-flung suburbs that rely entirely on driving. In an era of permanently high gasoline prices, the foreclosed houses will probably be raised. You will pick up the tab. Could we make our cities car-free? Would this kill our economy? Merchants in the pedestrian districts of Europe would fear only the return of cars people flock to these delightful areas. The automobile industry no longer has a stranglehold on American public policy. New urban highway construction has stopped. A few new urban rail systems have been built. Once mighty GM has gone bankrupt and you bailed them out. We have seen some European examples, but what would a car-free American city look like? Take Manhattan as an example. Streetcars replace crosstown buses, as is already planned for 42nd Street. The 2nd Avenue subway would be completed. These few changes provide a complete grid of good public transport. Or consider Los Angeles, the poster child for autocentric cities. Some areas of the city might eventually return to various green uses, with the population clustering around transit stops. The change to car-free cities allows us to reoccupy our cities. We can greatly improve their sustainability while enjoying a dramatic improvement in the quality of our lives. No futuristic technology is required. The simple step of once again allowing the mixing of uses brings most goods and services within easy walking distance. It is difficult to imagine any sustainable future for our cities that does not remove most cars from them. Since the improvements from completely removing cars are so great, we should choose this option. The construction and conversion of new and existing car-free cities can provide employment in the building trades for decades. This labor-intensive work can provide millions of good jobs. We should give critical consideration to the car-free option. However, there appear to be no significant barriers to its widespread adoption. It offers realistic hope for a better future for the 99%.